Welcome, Happy New Year. It's the first time I've got to say it. Welcome to 2021, and I'm just honored that you're here. If you're new, uh, maybe you just decided, hey, it's a new year. Maybe it's time to get a new rhythm in your life. Maybe it's been a while since you've been in church. You're like, all right, it's a new year. It's time for a new start. I know that's how a lot of us feel every time we turn the page into a new year. And so I just want to welcome you. Glad you're here. And if you are connecting with us online as a Global X fam, we just want to welcome you as well. Help me out, church. I just want to say... We're glad to have you from wherever you're tuning in from. We're honored to have you be a part of us and this journey, what God's doing in our life. You know, I I got so excited, I know so many of us were, that we were able to flip the calendar to 21 so we could say good riddance to 2020. And it didn't take very long. I'm not even going to go there, but I just wanted to say this was a pretty crazy week, was it not? I mean, I was not expecting this, and it just reminded me, right, where I thought, oh, we're finally through 2020. It reminded me that that's not the case, okay? And so here we are in a new year, and uh, if you're just joining us, here's something that we like to do as a church family. We create rhythms. I believe there's natural rhythms, there's natural seasons to life, And, and so every first of the year, We have a season in our church where we like to begin by giving God the first and the best. Amen? That we want to, I want to start off a new year saying, God, I'm going to make you a priority. God, I want direction for the rest of the year. And so we launched into this season called Move, 21 days of prayer and fasting. I know it is your absolute favorite thing in the world because you love giving up stuff. I know we all do. But I believe there's something instrumental in the life of someone who follows Jesus to engage in prayer and fasting, even if we don't love it. I believe it's important. How many of you, just real quick, show of hands, something, there's something that you decided over the next three weeks that you are going to give up. Raise your hand if you raise. Okay, awesome. A lot of people, if you're online, if you're doing it, just let us know. We'd love to know if you're joining with us in this. Now, here's why a lot of times we, we might engage in a season like this. We're looking for direction. But we're also getting to a place where we need God to do something in our lives. You see, I believe that even 21 days of prayer and fasting is so much more significant than New Year's resolutions. How many of you do resolutions? Raise your hand if you've got some resolutions. Almost no one crowd of you. Okay, maybe one or two. No, but you know why? You know why? I stopped doing resolutions years ago. You know why? Because I'm tired of failing at them every single year. We have the same resolutions year after year. I'm going to lose weight. I'm going to read more books. I'm going to start eating better. I'm going to go to the gym. Think about, I just listed most of your resolutions. We're going to do better in our finances. We're going to get out of debt. We're gonna, we have the same ones year after year. The reality is most of us have this gap in our lives. There's something that we need. We see that, but we don't have the power to change it. If we did, we would have already changed it. We come around to a new year, we're like, I don't have any resolutions, I'm good. I changed everything last year. But we don't do that. How many of you, let's just be honest today, have, have this, over this past year you have put some thought out there, you've maybe prayed if you believe in God, that there's something that you need to change in your life, but you need God to step in. How many of you have something in your heart right now, you're saying, I need God to move? Raise your hand if you do. So many of us. We, we need God. Maybe, maybe it's in a, a, a relationship. There's something that, God, I need you to change something. Because if I could, I would have. It could be your physical health. You know, it's like, okay, I, this is the year where I'm going to get my cholesterol down. This is the year where I'm going to start working out. This is the year, and I need to because the doctor's telling me I need to. But I just can't seem to do it. I don't know what it is. It could be your emotional health. It could be that you just, this past year, just threw you into just turmoil and you've been dealing with depression and you've been dealing with despair and all of these thoughts that you don't want to have and you're like, God, I don't want these anymore because you need God to move in your life. How many of you probably need God to move in your finances? God, we don't want to live like this anymore. I'm sick and tired of feeling the the tension of this and not having enough. I, I think the truth is that most of us, if we're honest, we've got something in our life where we're saying, God, I need you to move this. I need you to change something. Listen, if that's your prayer, then prayer and fasting is for you. 
There's something about engaging God in a, in a season, a dedicated season, where you say, God, I need you to move in my life. And by the way, if you're in that place today, I've got some really good news for you. You are in the perfect position to experience a miracle from God. I don't know if you feel this way. A lot of times I, I, there are things that I need God to do in my life, and they're miracles. And if you're sitting here today or you're watching this, you're saying, I need a miracle. I've got good news. You're in the perfect position to experience it. See, nobody wants to be in place where they need a miracle, but everybody wants a miracle. And I want to share a story with you today as we kind of just go through the season together to encourage you. And so if you got your Bible with you or electronic device, I want to encourage you to get it out. And open it up or turn it on to Judges chapter 6. I want to share a story with you. Judges, by the way, is the sixth book of your Bible. Um, no, it's actually the seventh, isn't it? Did anybody pick up on that? It's the seventh. Judges, the seventh book of the Old Testament. We're going to be in chapter 6. And I want to give you just a quick context before we dive into this story. Now, if you follow the story before this, what you see is a nation... Okay, the Israelites that God had brought out of slavery and out of Egypt after hundreds of years, and, and he led them to the promised land. In fact, um, last week we just, we, we heard a message uh, from Pastor Russ that was so powerful and so inspiring about needing to move into the promised land. And, and, and so here they do, and they move into the promised land, and they settle, and God makes them a promise. He says to them, if you will follow me and me alone. If you will serve me and not other gods like other nations, but you will serve me alone. He says, I will protect you and I will favor you and I will bless you and you will always keep this land. But here's the problem. They didn't. They got comfortable. They started to get jealous of all the neighboring nations around them. They wanted to be like them. They wanted to worship their gods and idols. And so God removed his hand of favor, his protection from them. And what you find in the Bible through the book of Judges is a story of an ebb and flow of, of God taking his hand of, of, of protection off and then them being attacked by nations around and then God raising up a judge, that's why it's called judges, that would free them, that would lead them to victory for a certain amount of time until they turn away from God. And it just happened over and over. Well, at this particular time in Judges 6, you find out that because of Israel's unfaithfulness, God removed his hand and the, the neighboring nation, the Midianites, would come in and attack them over and over. Them and the Amalekites and these other nations. In other words, God had taken his hand off. And they would just come in and they would, they would send raiding parties in. And they would take their crops and destroy the rest. And they would just oppress them and bully them. And then all of a sudden, finally, the Midianites just decided, we're just going to take your land. Back in ancient culture, by the way, uh, it was kind of like the game of risk. But they basically said, if we want your land and we think we're, you're, we're stronger than you, we'll just go take it. Okay, that was the way it operated back then. And so what we find out is the Midianites, okay, to an army of over 100,000, some say more than 120,000, settle in on the valley. In other words, they moved in and they said, we're going to fight you. And Israel was scared to death. And so something interesting in Judges 6, verse 6, here's what it says. It says that Midian so impoverished the Israelites that they did what to the Lord? Everybody say it out loud. They, come on, say it a little bit louder. They, they cried out to the Lord for help. Have you ever been at a place in your life where you didn't know where else to turn? So it resulted in you crying out to the Lord. That, that's where they are. Have you ever stared at impossible odds and said, God, I don't know what else to do. If you've ever had a doctor look at you or a loved one and say, this is a diagnosis that may end in death. If you've ever gotten to a place where you're in such financial upheaval that there's no way for you to dig your way out. If you've ever been in, in, in one of those situations where you feel like it's impossible, you know what a lot of times, that's when we finally get to a place where we say, I'm crying out for help. Whether you believe in God or not, 
Most of us, when we get to the end of our rope, we're going to cry out for God. Can I just encourage you, maybe, maybe in this season of fasting and praying, it's going to be a dedicated time for you to prioritize this, not wait for you to be in the crisis. Where you're going to say, God, I, I'm going to cry out for you because I need you. Whatever that thing is that you need God to move, that's what we're doing. In fact, I want to encourage you, you've heard this, that Tuesday night, we've got an opportunity where we're just opening the doors to, to come. If you have a mountain you need moved in your life, why don't you actually show up and say, God, I need your help. I need your help. Something will happen when you, when you step into it. And so here's what happened. They, they began to cry out for help. And it says in verse 11 and 12, here's God's response. It says that the angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak in Ophrah that belonged to Joash the Abizrite, where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press to keep it from the Midianites. When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, the Lord is with you. What did he call him? Say it out loud. Mighty. I love this picture because Gideon is hiding in a wine press to thresh wheat. Now, I know you probably don't thresh wheat most days. You just go to the grocery store and buy stuff. But I like the picture of what's happening when God shows up in an angel. That Gideon is in a wine press. Now, by the way, what a wine press was in those days was often an outcropping out of rock. It would be a flat, rocky area that kind of just kind of fell into a little basin. And that's where they would put grapes from the harvest and they would stomp on them. And the juice would flow into the basin and then they scoop it out into containers and allow it to ferment. Yes, they allowed it to ferment. That's how they made wine. So here he is in a place where you make wine, but he's threshing wheat on the rock. Why? Because he was afraid. So he's going into a place of shelter, a cave-like area. Why? Because the Midianites would just come in and steal anything that they would try to do, would harass them. So here he is, and I love this picture. He's hiding in a cave, threshing wheat so that the Midianites, the bullies, don't take their lunch. And God shows up through an angel. And the angel looks at him, and I love this phrase. And he says, because here's the contradiction. Gideon's hiding. And God says, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Mighty warrior. He calls him something that he certainly does not seem to be. And when I used to look at this passage, I'll be honest, I always used to think of it in these terms, that God sees the potential in you even if nobody else does. And I believe that. God knows the potential he's put inside of, you know, potential is maybe one of the most valuable assets that we have and we don't even see it. See, potential is unseen power. It's unseen ability. Potential is one of those things that if you are a good manager, you can see in somebody. If you're a good leader, you can see in someone. If you're a parent, you can see it in your kids. It's, it's potential. And I used to see this passage and go, oh, God had to speak forth the potential that he had already put inside of Gideon. But this time, as I was in this fast, as I'm praying and I'm saying, God, show me. God gave me a new perspective. Give me a new perspective. Maybe it wasn't about the untapped ability of Gideon. Maybe it wasn't that Gideon had such incredible eye-hand coordination and he was using it to thresh wheat, but he could have really been using it to swing a sword. Maybe it wasn't that God was saying, oh, I see the leadership inside of you. You're a natural born leader even though you're hiding. And I just came here to call it forth. Maybe it wasn't any of those things. Maybe the, the key in that phrase wasn't mighty warrior, but it was what God said before that. Oh, you need to look in your Bible. You need to look at that sentence. When the angel saw him, what did he say? You ought to underline this in your Bible, highlight it. He said, the Lord is with you. The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. 
You see, the problem is that most of us, it's not that we just have untapped potential for days. Okay, maybe that's not what God was speaking to because here he is hiding in a cave. He certainly doesn't seem like a mighty warrior. He's not engaged in battles. He's a young person. He says, I'm the weakest of my clan. It might be that the way he saw himself, what God needed to reveal was there's a difference when God is with you. What, what, I, what I need you to see is this. Until I see that God is with me, all I can see is my inability. Until I know that God, when he is with me, that it changes everything about my situation. That it might not be my skill. It might not be my untapped potential that matters so much. But it could be me understanding this truth. That if God is with me, that something changes in every situation of my life. Do you know what I'm talking about? I have a truth that I, I want you to get because so many of us have been maybe living in a time where we just, we feel like there's so much turmoil. We feel like our life's a mess and we think God's not in it. And, and maybe God wants you to see it differently. Let, let me give you this truth today. And as a pastor, I've just alliterated the crap out of it because I just want you to remember it. But, but I believe there's, there's real truth to this. And that is this, your potential is not based on your power but on God's presence. Can I say it again for those in the back and the risers? Your potential is not based on your power, your skill, your ability. But what if we saw that it was based on God's presence? To say, I need God's presence in my life. God said, I'm with you, therefore you're a mighty warrior. If I'm with you, you can do more than you could ever imagine if I'm with you. If we could get this truth inside of us, there's some verses in the Bible that might actually come to life and not just be these cute little phrases and platitudes that we like to quote and put on bumper stickers, but would become something that we actually live. Like this one, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. I can do all things through Christ. We are more than conquerors. How? Through him who loves us. Do you understand? This is a key. That, that's why this is so important in this moment. Perhaps this is what God is wanting to do in this fast. We're saying, God, I need you to move in my life. Maybe by you saying, God, I'm taking some things away so that I can make room for you in my life. What's going to happen is you're going to discover your potential, not because of what you can do, but because of God's presence in your life. And so God looked at Gideon, and he said, I'm with you, mighty warrior. And then God told him to do something. Can I show you this? Look at verse 14. The Lord turned to him, and he said what? Everybody say that word out loud with me. He said... Go. Come on, let's say it again. He said, go. God then turned to him and said, go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? God told Gideon, now it's time to move. Go in the strength you have. This is the guy who's hiding in a cave. What strength? Th this is the guy who's afraid of what's going to happen. Here's what I want you to see. This is what God showed me. That in this moment where they're crying out and they're praying and they're fasting, surely they're fasting. That's what you do when you get desperate. In a moment when they're praying and they're crying out to God, and here's their prayer. We saw this earlier. God, move in our life. We're outnumbered. We have no hope. I need you to move. Have you ever felt that way? Maybe you feel that way today. God, I need you to change something. That was their prayer. Here's God's answer. Gideon, you move. 
God, I need a miracle in my finances. I'm waiting for you to rain money out of the sky. I'm waiting for you to give me a winning lotto ticket this time. I'm waiting for them to call me in and promote me, double my, God, I'm praying for you to move. Could it be that in the season of praying for God to move, that God might look at you and say, you move. I want a miracle. God says, I want you to move. I, I want you to change my situation. God says, I'm waiting for you to move. Can I, can I give you this truth today because I see it all throughout scripture? What if God's move is waiting on your move? What if God's move is waiting on your, I need you to see this because listen, so often as Christians, <laughs> this is what we think, my back's against the wall, I need a miracle, I'll just stand here and wait for God to move. God, I'm waiting for a move. God, I need a miracle. God says, I know you need a miracle. Guess what I want? I want you to move first. How many times are we crying out for God to move and God says, I'm waiting for you to move? Can I tell you this truth that I found all throughout Scripture? Is that every place where God moves in the miraculous, the supernatural, and the powerful is always connected with somebody moving. What I'm trying to say is that the movement of God is almost always synchronized with the movement of our faith. Can I give you some examples? I like Abraham. I think about Abraham. God spoke to Abraham who was barren, 75 years old. His wife, 65 years old. They have no kids. It's the one thing they want desperately. I imagine how many years they prayed to God. God, give us a child. God, we want to have kids. God, we want this. And so what does God do? God speaks to him and says, move. In Genesis 12, he says, pick up your family and move to a land I will show you, and then I will make you into a great nation. God wanted to see him move first in faith before God moved on his behalf. I, I, think, about, I think about Moses. God says, I'm going to free my nation, but you got to move first, Moses. You know, God could have done it any way he wanted to. But God chose a guy named Moses, and he said, I want you to go before Pharaoh, and I want you to say, let my people go. And he won't move, but that's when I'm going to show up in the miraculous. Moses, you move, then I'll move. I think about when God brought the Israelites into the promised land under Joshua, a young, inexperienced, but a, a leader now, and God told him to do what? March around the city of Jericho seven days. Joshua, you move, then I'll move. Are you seeing it? Are you seeing it? When God used Elijah the prophet, that through him he brought a drought on the land because of Israel's disobedience. He said, I'll provide for you. When provision ran up, God said, you move to Zarephath because I have a widow that will supernaturally take care of you even though she has nothing. What I'm trying to show you is this truth. Because here's what I, I don't want us to do. I don't want us for 21 days to pray about the, the hard thing in our life and the impossibility and the the area where we need God to move. And we just look at it like, God, okay, I'm waiting for you to drop something out of heaven. When what God might drop out of heaven is a word to say, you move first. You see, he showed me this one time through a fast. In 2010, our, our church had kind of been growing just rapidly when we were in Lithopolis. And we had expanded our, audit, uh, our kids' facility, built this whole kids' wing. And, but we were out of room in our auditorium. And I knew that we needed to expand it to make more room. And so we went to the bank. It wasn't going to be an expensive expansion, but it was right on the heels of a time when our economy had been in recession, 2008, 2009. And though we were doing well financially, the bank had told us one moment, yes, we can fund the expansion. And then right before we went to do it, we applied. In 2010, the bank said, whoa, 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 whoa we, we, we're going to pull back. Not because of us, but because of the economy. And we just don't, we're just too afraid to do this. And it kind of felt like the rug got pulled out from under us because I, I felt like that was the direction that God had given us. And I didn't know what to do for the rest of that year. We just, we prayed for God to move. 
That's what we did. God, we need you to move. And then we started in 2011. We did a fast. And that was the primary thing that I was praying for in that fast, at the beginning of a year, just like this. I said, God, we need you to move. And the whole time through this fast and prayer, I get nothing. Nothing from God. Nothing. No, no, no bank doesn't call us back up, and I'm, I'm expecting something miraculous. And the very last day of the fast, in my, just my personal time, my daily reading through the Bible, like every year my, my habit's been for years, every year I read through the entire Bible. And I'm reading through, and I get to this place in Exodus chapter 14. And I read something. It's just so funny how it just timed perfectly the last day of the fast when I'm kind of discouraged. And I feel like I, I, I didn't hear anything from God. I didn't see any mir miraculous provision for this move. And all of a sudden, I read this. Now, now, let me give you the context in Exodus 14, okay. The Israelites that came out of Egypt, they marched several days until they got blocked in right at a flood stage river, sea, the Red Sea, with mountains all around. By the way, the Egyptians changed their mind. Many of you probably know this story, and then they kind of pursued them. So they're locked in, they're hemmed in. They've got this massive flood stage Red Sea in front of them, mountains with one way in, an army pressing in on them. And, and they didn't know what to do. And uh, so <laughs> Moses tells the people, Trust in God. Stand and see the deliverance of God. He's going to do something. Just watch. That's what he says to them. As I'm reading, I read then verse 15 and 16. And it says this. Then the Lord said to Moses, why are you crying out to me? Tell the Israelites to do what? Everybody say it out loud. To Come on, you can do better than that. Tell the Israelites to move on. Move where? There's a Red Sea at flood stage. We're all going to drown. Raise your staff, Moses. Stretch out your hand over the sea to divide the water so that the Israelites can go through the sea on dry ground. And the moment I read that, it was just as if an angel of the Lord showed up to me. Because the moment I read that, God quickened something inside of me. And he said, Tim, you are standing around waiting for me to move. But I am telling you that if you would move in faith, you would see the hand of God show up in the miraculous. Stop crying out to me and start moving. I said, what do you mean? But, but something happened inside of me. See, that was the greatest thing to happen that fast. It wasn't the miracle I, I thought he would give, but it was the word that he gave that told me to move. And from that moment, I started calling every business there. I, I started to meet with people. I said, listen, I don't know what to do, but something's got to change. Can you help us? What can we do? And through those conversations, God led us to a new person in a financing company that stepped in and said, we believe in you, and we'll fund this. And within months, we had started the expansion on the project, and I traced it all back to that one word from God when God looked at me and said, you move. What I'm trying to say is through this season, you might be praying for God to move and God might speak to you and say, I'm waiting for you to move. We often want God to do the miraculous on our behalf. Can I say this to you today? Perhaps God doesn't want to do something for you, but with you. No, no, no. Some of you need to hear that. Because you've, you've grown up believing that in every situation, I'm just waiting for God to do something for me. What I came to tell you is that it's possible in this moment that what God wants to do is not do something for you, but with you. He's going to invite you and give you the courage, the faith to step out of the boat. To say, I don't know what's going to happen here. But I feel like, God, you're telling me to move in a direction. And so I'm going to move. Maybe, maybe that's what this fast is going to do for you. See, when you take some things away that you trust on, that you lean on every day, what it does is it creates space for you to hear the voice of God. 
That's why I'm a big believer, and you can fast when you feel led to fast. Fasting social media or some type of media or something because it's constant noise. And what I need is I just want to hear a word from God to tell me to move. What do I do? God wants to speak to you, but that's what a fast might do. It might not be that God's going to drop a check in your mailbox. It could be that God's going to speak to you and say, it's time to give that thing up. It's time to sell that. It's time to change that. So God spoke to Gideon, and he said, you move. Go in the strength you have and save Israel. Am I not sending you? Now I want to read to you what happened in chapter 7, and then we'll close. Because Gideon did it. He trusted God. I mean, he did this thing with the fleece. We skipped over that, but that was just him, like, double check, three, triple check. Okay, God, are you sure? And then he amassed an army, a measly army. Didn't compare to the one that they were fighting, but but he was like, okay, you're a mighty warrior, so, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take this, this moment and step into it. Judges 7, verse 1, it says, early in the morning, Jerubbabel, that was Gideon, there's just a different name, but it says, and all his men camped at the spring of Herod. The camp of Midian was north of them in the valley near the hill of Morah. And the Lord said to Gideon, you have too many men. I cannot deliver Midian into their hands or Israel would boast against me. My own strength has saved me. Now announce to the army, anyone who trembles with fear may turn back and leave Mount Gilead. So 22,000 men left while 10,000 remained. Hold on, I want you to get that. Here's what God showed me. When he first showed up and he spoke to Gideon, what did he say? Go in the strength you have and save Israel. So he did. And he got an army of 32,000 men. Most of them scared to death because they were outnumbered. And when they all show up, camp, get ready, we'll go into battle. All right, God, I'm doing what you told me to do. God looks at Gideon and says, no, 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 no. You got too many men. You see, because if I give you the victory, you'll say, I did it in my strength. Wait a minute, God, which is it? Go in the strength you have. Wait a minute, not in your strength. I'm so confused right now. And, and so what God did was he began to whittle down the army. And if you know the story, and I'll give you the short version. They went from 32,000 down to 300. He let all but 300 people go. And God said, perfect. Now you're in position so that I get the glory. Here's what I wanted to show you. God made Gideon go on a fast. He fasted soldiers. It wasn't even his choice. <laughs> what, what's a fast? It's where you strip something away that you depend upon so that you can learn to really trust in God as your only true source? What is a fast where you take away, where you say, I'm gonna let go of the things that I depend upon physically, emotionally, spiritually. I'm gonna let go of some of these things that I hold on to so that I can learn to depend upon God as my only true source. Why does a fast matter? Is because this is what we do. Because what do we depend upon? Some of you would say, I depend on my hard work. I work hard every day. I bust my butt. I work hard so we can survive, so we can get ahead. Hey, there's nothing wrong with that. That's incredible. You know what I'd rather have than just my hard work? God's favor in my life. Some of you say, well, I, I just, I, I lean on my leadership and my skill so that I can lead my business and make decisions. That's all great. You know what I'd rather have? I'd rather have one word from God telling me move in this direction, even if it doesn't make sense, because I know one word from God is all I need. Some of you say, I, I rely on my good works. Can I just say right now, there's some of you that when it comes to God, you've been relying on how you live. 
I, I try to do good things. I mess up sometimes, but if I, I just try to be a good person. Do you know how often we do? We rely on our Christian traditions. We rely on a faith that was given to us from our parents. We rely on just going to church like it's some sort of covering for us to somehow make us good with God. But if I can tell you this truth today, there is nothing that you or I could ever do to be good enough for God because that is the message of the gospel. That's the message of grace. That's how it works. Here's how it works. You don't depend on yourself, but you depend on what Jesus did on the cross. You know what I love about the picture of Jesus on the cross? It was that God took Jesus' weakest moment physically and used it to accomplish his greatest work in all of humanity. And so in a fast, you, I feel weak. In a fast physically, I feel like something's missing. No, no, no. What's actually happening is you're creating room for God to move. And when God moves, listen to me, a lot of times, here's what we're looking for. I'm looking for the miracle from heaven. But what it really most often looks like is a word from heaven that says, you move in faith and then see what I will do. That's what God wants to do in us. Come on, would you all stand to your feet? I just believe that God wants to use this moment for us to experience something. Can I tell you this truth, that the greatest victory in your life will come on the other side of your greatest surrender. Let me say it again. Your greatest victory in your life will always come on the other side of your surrender. L let, me, let me finish the story here. Most of you probably know it. God gave Gideon and 300 men the victory over more than 100,000 soldiers. But it came when Gideon surrendered to God. And I don't know, as we're beginning this fast, and maybe some of you, I don't know if I should do it. Jump in, jump in, jump in, jump in. Because it could be that God wants to move you in a new direction. And the first thing that he's going to do to give you victory in your life is he's going to call you to surrender that thing. This stands in the way. Come on, let's just bow our heads and a moment of prayer. God, I pray right now by your spirit. God, you would speak to us. I pray, God, that we could in this moment hear your voice. That you would call us to surrender something. I don't know what it is, but maybe God's going to call you to surrender. Maybe it's a priority. Maybe it's the way you've been operating your life, your relationship. It may be a relationship that doesn't honor God and you know is not the right one and God's going to speak to you and say, it's time to surrender it to me. God, I need you to move on my finances. God saying, okay, I'm gonna need you to surrender over and trust me in how I tell you to operate. God, I need a miracle. God, my emotions, my mental health, God's gonna say, okay, it's time to surrender in this season and say, God, I need more of you. Father, I pray right now that thing that you're calling us to move in, I pray, God, you're revealing it right now.